We are in the BI Platform Studio and I'm speaking with Barry Devlin remotely, um, where we will be talking about uh, data mesh, data lake house, data fabric. Um, it's a hot topic, Barry. Um, we, we even run a, a two-day course with you on, on the same topic. Um, what, so in your opinion, what are the centralized bottlenecks that data mesh tries to solve introducing a domain-driven approach? I think there are two sets of bottlenecks, um, one technical and one organizational that the folks at uh, the data mesh proponents propose to, to deal with. Um, in the technical sense, what they're saying is that the, the idea of a centralized data store for a warehouse or a lake, and indeed centralized um, uh, data pipelines, uh, ETL pipelines are all too too much to handle. We, we're living in a distributed world. We're living in a cloud-based world. Everything should be distributed and trying to bring everything back together into the um, into the warehouse or into indeed even into a, into a data lake is is a bottleneck. And and you can see some some um, uh, some truth in in that particular thinking because single points of failure, single. Uh, areas where you gather stuff together can be bottlenecks. So that's the technology side of things. But they also interestingly address the idea that there are organizational bottlenecks, in particular, the idea of a centralized IT team that is responsible for designing and populating a data warehouse or lake. I mean, they are also a, a bottleneck. And we've heard this for so many years, you know, how do, how do we get our requirements through to IT? They take so long to answer. So Data Mesh attempts to address these issues by really removing these centralized technologies and centralized organizational structures in terms of um, getting rid of those bottlenecks. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're, you already mentioned the decentralized IT department. But by introducing this architecture, are we not going back to the old-fashioned data silos, or, or what's different this time? Uh, Werner, that's the sixty-four thousand dollar question, and of course, in, in some sense, I'm biased here because you know the data warehouse is my baby, and it is centralized, um, and it was designed to get away from the siloed approach. Um, I actually think that this is the real challenge for data mesh, and I have not seen from the proponents a really good answer to that question. Um, they do talk about much more about this, uh, let's call it a service oriented approach to data, which really does split things up. And every time we ask about how do you bring things back together and how do you manage them together? I don't get, I don't get good answers. So it's one of my major concerns about, about data mesh and how it will eventually pan out. Because I think it's, it's a good idea to, to try to remove some of the centralization and some of the bottlenecks. But if you introduce the old uh, siloed approach again, then you, you're in, a, you're in a, as bad a state as you were when you started. Yeah, yeah. okay. And when we go to the data mesh, uh, of the data fabric, the data fabric focuses on automation using AI and active metadata. Um, can you elaborate on what is meant with active metadata in this sense? Sure. Well, you know, if you think about metadata in the ordinary sense, metadata is sort of static. You create it when you um, uh, design your ETL systems or you gather it uh, as the business users define what they mean and what the questions they want to answer are. So it's a sort of static thing in many people's minds. When uh, the proponents of data fabric say active metadata, what they're simply saying is this metadata needs to be completely real time. So if something changes in the environment, the metadata immediately reflects this. And this is something that you needed for a service oriented or a microservices approach anyway, but it becomes much more important when you think about using AI um, or uh, machine learning on the metadata itself so that you don't have to, as an IT person or IT department, um, really keep managing and keep, keep track on all of the changes that are happening in the background. So active real time is, is I think the answer. Yeah, okay. And which tools and capabilities are needed to be able to implement a data fabric? Well, I think from what I've just said, good tools around metadata are going to be extraordinarily important. If you haven't got a good catalog, if you haven't got your uh, uh, business um, glossaries and all of that sort of stuff in place and working 
you're going to have difficulty using AI uh, and machine learning to analyze it. Of course, you need AI and machine learning tools. Um, so um, having vendors provide uh, machine learning and uh, tools that, that actually can understand metadata and uh, address those issues is also important. And I think the other one that is uh, important is data virtualization. So if you have, as Data Fabric says, let's keep all of our existing data uh, silos, all of our existing data warehouses, all of our existing operational systems, everything you've got in Data Fabric, you say, let's try and keep it and get good value from it. Then you need data virtualization over the top of all of that in order to create a, a single unified view for, for the business people. Okay. And in your view, what are some of the main challenges that companies will face when trying to implement a data fabric? Um, in comparison to, let's say, data mesh, I think data fabric is, is, is a more comfortable thing for, for, for uh, companies and enterprises to implement because it's very much an extension of existing systems. It's very much an extension of what we used to call logical data warehouse. And so people who understand the data, the logical data warehouse approach, I think will, I won't say they, will, they won't struggle, but I think that they will have um, an easier job to, um, to get that implemented. So I think it's the same type of, of um, challenges that companies faced when they were actually um, looking to move from a single um, physical data warehouse or data lake to a much more virtualized approach. Okay. okay finally, um, what's your view on the data lake house uh, concept and, and how does it fit in? Well, the data lake house is an interesting one, I think, because essentially it is, um, it is a bit like data fabric starting from what we have. So the, the proponents of, of data lake house say, hey, all of the data is in the lake and we're, we're moving some of that data from the lake to the warehouse. Why don't we have a very integrated and um, well-managed um, environment within the lake house, which is a combination of portmanteau, portmanteau word of, of lake and warehouse. Um, why don't we have an integrated environment for that? And I think that's an interesting thought, especially as people move uh, their warehouses and their lakes to the cloud. The possibility to put all of these things together on a single platform is, is interesting and is well worth evaluating. And it comes, you know, if you look at the vendors who are promoting it, some of them come from the very much the data lake environment. So they're saying, let's build it on Spark, let's build it on the, if you like, the modern tools. Um, others might be coming at it from the more relational database environment. You might see Microsoft Azure talking about a lake house. And they're simply saying, well, yeah, underneath our Azure uh, database, you have um, object stores and you can have this combined uh, set of unstructured, and I hate that word, data and structured data all in the same environment and all managed together. So I think it's, it's a very practical um, uh, way and a very technology focused way of addressing some of the problems of a very uh, diverse and big data environment. Okay, well, thank you very much for the interview, Barry.